<laughs> you look fine. Here. I am your host for Bizapalooza Chat, and welcome to our Monday plugged in version. I am so excited to share with you today my special guest, John Hall, author of Top of Mind. What is it? Top of Mind, use content to unleash your influence and engage those who matter to you. Welcome, John. I'm really happy to have you on the chat today. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So while the folks are tumbling into the chat and while I handle some housekeeping issues here, why don't you talk a little bit about who you are, what you do, and kind of tell us how you got to the book. Sure, yeah. Um, really, the I mean, I, I was actually an entrepreneur from eight, uh, third grade, I guess you could say. I started selling my lunch at school and making money that way. And so I've, I've had a natural kind of entrepreneurial spirit. And then I ended up getting into real estate and some investing and uh, at the same time of uh, um, working for a larger investment company. And, and while I was doing that, uh, I ended up meeting uh, my two co-founders, Kelsey and, and Brent and uh, of Influence & Co. And the idea behind Influence & Co. was that we saw a huge opportunity to earn, pe earn companies and people's trust by creating engaging content coming from you consistently. And so it was kind of this trend that we've seen the last five to 10 years of, we, we've gone away from marketing about me and my product and how awesome we are to just being very concerned about how you educate a specific audience so that you truly engage and help them. And so, um, you know, we started Influence & Co. It, it, we, we, uh, it was perfect timing. We grew substantially in the first uh, five years. We're about five years old. We're around, uh, let's say, 80 to 100 full-time employees and um, have, have accomplished quite a bit. But, um, but during that time, what was great about the kind of what I was learning personally was that what we were doing was not something that was crazy new or rocket science. It was engaging people in a way consistently so that you stay top of mind by creating the content that's truly going to help them or engage them or get them to think of you in that right moment. And so top of mind uh, actually started I would say the idea of it at the book came three or four years ago or and it really hit about two years ago because we started seeing all these things not just in content but in engagement just how I communicate with on a one-on-one -on -one level if you earn people's trust you just talked about Anita Campbell in a way to uh, you know before we got started where you were like great person awesome and I can tell Anita did things for you to engage you in a way and I think it was for from a trusted resource side of things where you truly are like, you know, I trust this person. And I think uh, the more deliberate we are about relationships and how we're looking at um, how we do engage others, the more that we come to their mind at just the right moment. And so that's where the book came in is that I wanted to create a book that really helped people create processes and, and an, uh, I would say a mindset of how do you um, engage, help people um, get in front of people in the right way so that in the right moment, it's your name or your company's name that comes to mind, just similar how when we were just chatting, Anita came to your mind. And so I wanted to write a book about that. That's awesome. So I think it, the book is absolutely outstanding. And I think that you're on to something. Um, you know, when I was at, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the CEB folks, they recently got bought out by Gartner. And they do a lot of research with small business owners. And one of the bits of research that they talked about was that I think it's something, it's almost two times. It's like 1.675 or something that a small business owner is most likely to listen to and take action on advice given to them by another small business owner who they trust or who's an expert yeah. in that conversation. And so influencer campaigns have been really, really popular lately, in fact, talking about Anita Campbell, she used to run these influencer awards that we did way ahead of the game. So that brings to mind another, qu a general question I have for you. How have consumer needs and expectations changed? When did you- I mean, it's just, shift? yeah, I mean, it's just changed. I mean, it's like how many years ago? I mean, I grew up on door-to-door -door sales. I grew up 
on, you know, go, yeah, going to a door and saying, buy my, in, in the book, I use popcorn and pizza as an example of it was terrible products I was selling, but I could still sell them because there wasn't all this, there, there's a couple things that have changed. One, there's more information out there than ever has been before. And so people know that they don't have to believe you face to face. They can actually go online, do research, figure it out. And um, so there's a natural trust barrier there. Um, there's also a generation. I was just telling someone that um, I'm th somebody said, wow, you're a young entrepreneur. And I go, no, I'm not. I go, I'm not a young entrepreneur anymore. I go, I'm 33. And they said, that's really young. I go, that's I, I'm actually 50 percent of the world's population is younger than me. So I, there's no way I can be a young entrepreneur at that point where I'm, I'm actually, uh, you know, 50 percent of the, the whole world is younger than me. And so, uh, you know, I, I look at that and, and those generations are very different. Um, there is a this lack of trust, and they they are a little more curious and skeptical of things. And there's a variety of things that are affecting that right now. You can say one, it's, there's some political things that are happening that have created media and marketing uh, barriers. You can you can also say that the the landscape is different than how we grew up. And so we and a lot of people are, are scared of that. I'm not scared of it. I let's embrace that. If there's a lack of trust, let's take it as our responsibility as thought leaders, as influencers, as companies that are leading an industry to gain back that trust. And I think one of the ways to do that is by getting the right information, education. I think education is truly the number one way to help people make better decisions. So if you can do that, whether it be through a content strategy or some way of communicating, you, you got to try and do that. Excellent. So what are, first of all, let me, you have bunches of fans, so I have to so tell you that. if you can do that, whether it be through a content strategy or some way of communicating, you, you got to try and do that. We're getting a little feedback there. What was that? <laughs> you have bunches of fans, so I have to so tell you that. Do that, whether it be that was, I had, I don't know what I had doing. <laughs> <laughs> At first, I was like, "Whoa, is that you know? Is that how I sound?" <laughs> I guess it is. My, my YouTube just started playing. I'm like, "Wow, that's really weird." Okay, so no I want to talk about the folks who are in the chat. We've got some new folks that I want to give a shout out to. Flea Market Zone. I love it when small businesses jump into the chat. It's totally awesome. As is independent retail. So we have lots of new people. Shout out to the new folks. Welcome, welcome. And as they're kind of uh, getting into the flow of the topic, I wanted to ask another question, which is sort of like a how-to question, which is how to build a helpful, authentic, and consistent brand that serves others. You talked a little bit about content, but let's dig a little bit deeper. And I know we'll get into the weeds of this whole thing, but talk a little bit about content. And I think uh, folks really struggle to find their voice inside of content that you know the balance between showing yourself as an expert helping your audience and at the same time kind of promoting yourself without promoting yourself yeah absolutely and yeah i'll, I'll get to that real quick but uh I, I do have to call out too is like independent retailer and some of these people chatting i love when you when you get engaged like this it's like i, I see the jimmy fallon uh visual there and it just cracks me up so definitely encourage especially the new people uh that's i love it's like when you're part of something like this you love when people engage with you and so i, I appreciate you guys um but the uh with, when it comes to building a brand like this is a very common i was actually just talking to someone who uh is a really really well-known and powerful person in the world and it's not just in the united states in the world and he said well John, like I, I actually like, and this guy has no ego. He's like, you know, I don't really want, I want, want the attention on my employees. I want the attention on other, you know, people. I don't need it. He's, he just goes, I really just don't want it. I don't even feel comfortable. And I just told him, I said, honestly, like I, I have to break you of this because you're, it's a, this actually is a leadership challenge. A part of leadership is it's leading. And yes, I want to support the people around me as well. I have an amazing staff. My co-founder is amazing. My VPs are uh, amazing. And you want to support them. You want to um, work on getting content from them as well and drawing attention to them. But a, a lot of times you have to look and say, do we want to lead uh, this industry? Do I want to be um, you know, someone that people trust in this area? And you have to get past the ego barriers. You have to get past the barriers. Those are self barriers that you're creating. Nobody is telling you you can't do it. Um, for me, I come at it from a standpoint is that I feel better about it if I'm helpful. If I'm not helpful, then I feel pretty crappy about it, to be honest with you, is that if there's um, attention on me that is not helpful to people, 
I don't love it as much. But if there's something that I can do with our company resources or, our, or my own resources to get the right information to people, to get to help people become better, that's when uh, I think it, it just it comes from such a better place and it makes me feel a lot more comfortable. So I, I think that it just depends your intention. If your intention is to be a showboat, um, there's a lot of showboats out there that get a lot of attention. Trust me, it's just not my way to do it. It's not the, the way I recommend it. I think true influence should be earned. And uh, if you trick people into it, somehow it already it always comes back to you or ultimately I've seen people do it by tricking and um, it, it just it's not the best way. So I would say earn influence and trust. Um, you know, don't try and hack it. I love it. Love it. I was just I was just quoting you and typing at lightning tweeting speed. So let's jump into the first question, right, which is what influences you share an example of being influenced by an influencer. I guess I sort of shared one, so you share one. See, well, so I'm not, and like, it's crazy, it's like, I'm influenced by people every day. Um, my, you know, I just mentioned my co-founder, some of my VPs, like, my staff influences me all the time. Um, I don't try and uh, basically set a, a, a box of, well, the people that influence me are like Joe Paluzzi or an Anita Campbell or uh, a fellow kind of, I guess you could say, you know, people who have, you know, followers. Um, I don't, say okay well I'm, I'm I think you actually miss out on opportunities to truly learn and listen to people when you when you do that and so as much as I want everybody on here and you to say hey follow me like and listen and I hope I'm helpful um, I think that you you have to be a consistent learner the best employees the best influencers the best people are always learning they don't know it all um, I try not to act like I know it all because of the fact is is that I am always learning and um, and it could be from a, a sales call that I was on listening and ghosting this morning that somebody brought up these challenges and barriers that they had where I was like, wow, that's interesting how like they have that writing challenge and how we're a resource for them in that way. I, I haven't heard that before. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that from me, what influences me is, uh, is trying to experience as much as I can from different people, um, different groups of people, different companies, and try and get as much information. I truly believe you make the best decisions when you have more information than anybody else. So I think that listening and, and engaging others, um, I tell my wife this because she's super shy and quiet and I talk way too much. Um, I go, honey, like if you if you want to make better decisions on something, you have to engage people, you have to make that effort. And she's like, John, I don't want like, come on, like, I don't want to go out and like have to do some of the things you do. And I'm like, I'm not saying you have to, but you have to make an effort to truly get information. And so I, I, I always tell people, form, form your watering holes, get a diverse group of watering holes. Um, get some, like, I mean, I might listen to something like a, a Joe Pelosi, but I also listen to people outside of our industry. I listen to, fr you know, and Joe's a friend. He, he wrote the forward to my book. Um, but I also listen to people that aren't as well known. Um, I've got probably one of my trusted advisors is a, is a name that you guys don't know that I kind of keep quiet because he doesn't like the attention. And I promised him but uh, not to not to draw attention to him, but uh, he's a great resource for me. And so I would say just be open, get your watering holes that are different that you can trust that can help you make better decisions. That's wonderful because I think a lot of folks come to the conclusion that to be an influencer, you either have to have, you have to be like a celebrity or you have to have, you know, millions of hits to your website. But I think this advice of uh, learning from everyone that you come in contact with and even people that aren't obvious influencers is uh, a great strategy to go by. Well, I had, a, I had a heck, just real quick, I had a, a heckler at a, uh, a keynote I just gave because of that question. They said, I, I made it a point to say that anybody can be an influencer. And they go, no, that's BS. And I go, oh, okay. And so, like, uh, and what I, the point I was trying to get across is that there's so many different times. Like, in, for example, in United Airlines' case, all it took was four people to influence that brand stock price significantly or a couple people around in that instance. Um, when we, we worked with LinkedIn on their contributor platform years ago, and when we were looking at it, sometimes all it took was like all it took was one person sharing it out or one person commenting, and like it was crazy to see the difference of what one person could do. Just let's say like some let's say somebody catches it and they send it to their their sister, who their sister is like you know has like uh, let's say that she's this this chief people officer for Southwest, and then she shares it out with the whole company. That one person is a significant influencer. They're the one that created that opportunity. Even though the, the chief people officer at Southwest has a lot of influence, 
the same time is that who really caused that and, and made that situation happen. So we have to remember that, like, honestly, everybody matters. Everybody uh, at this point has a voice and we have to um, do our best to to look at engaging everybody and not alienating people, not making certain groups feel bad and other people feel good. We have to look and say the big picture of who are the people we're trying to engage in, and anybody can make a difference at any time. So th that brings up a wonderful point, which is question number two. When you hear the word influence, what's your first reaction? I, I have a positive uh, view of it, obviously, because my company's called Influence & Co. Um, but, uh, and so I like hearing that. Um, but I, I mean, I think of it as uh, influence is a way to change or uh, make a behavioral change in someone. And I think that you can look at influence as negative because it can also be used to manipulate. Um, I look at it in a positive way because I tend to side towards education. And like, because like, for example, um, you know, somebody can put influence over someone by, uh, let's say, oh, blackmailing them. That's a way of influencing someone. I think that's a terrible way of doing influence. And I think that I look at influence in a way of um, how can you help someone so that they trust you? And so the, the way that I look at influence is all about trust. If someone trusts you, you can influence them in a positive way. And so that's where I think that we, we have these things called trust touch points. And in the book, uh, in Top of Mind, you can, you, I go over each one of those trust touch points and what you can do. Uh, sometimes it's helping out someone. If That's why I asked you before we got on this call, is like, how can I be helpful towards you? Because if I am able to help you out in the future and keep an eye out for you, and I hit one of those, you know, touch points in exactly what's valuable, there's a very good opportunity that you can, you're going to trust me, and then I have a positive influence on on you in the future. And so, um, that's those are the things that come to mind. Mm. That is some really, really great point. You know what? While you take a sip, I'm going to see share what some of the other folks' reactions are. Uh, cool. Alexia says someone or something that compels you to make changes in your own strategy or perspective is what happens when she thinks of influence. Robert Willard, who is a cohort right here in Cleveland with me, says, actually, it's negative. My first thought is to be defensive. So the key here is that it has to be genuine and sincere. I don't know. You know Tim Barry. Don't you know Tim Barry? Um, uh, I believe I do. Not, not well, but uh, uh, the name's familiar. Yeah. Uh -huh. See, I love what he says. He's a super thoughtful. Uh, he says, uh, my reaction to influence, and he's an influencer too, by the way. Yeah, no, I, I, that's why I clicked on the picture. I do know Tim. How you doing? <laughs> it smacks of selling reputation and trust, and it makes him nervous. And I think that's really, really an interesting thing, right? Because there is this um, push and pull with organizations, and some folks believe that you should not be quote unquote selling influence, and um, other folks believe, well, it does take time. And I. I think it all comes back to this content and thought leadership. I don't know that folks like yourself or even a Tim or myself or an Anita, any influencer, or even people who are on this chat who are influencers in their own uh, industries. I think when someone asks you to put your time and thoughts together to create content, I don't know that that is selling reputation. What do you think? Yeah, and for, I'm looking at Tim right now. First off, father of five, man. I'm, I'm father of two, and my wife's trying to talk me into more. So maybe we'll need your advice on other stuff in the future. But uh, I think that's a good, I think that's a good uh, topic to bring up because, and this actually, this dilemma happened to me this morning where um, there's some. It's a really legit company that's doing extremely well. But to be honest, we know that they have pretty bad intentions. Um, obviously, I'm not going to say their name, but uh, when I brought my co-founder, and I not even say bad intentions, I would just say they're, they're, they have a lot of problems that um, we have the discussion on. Do we take clients on like this? Um, because is it the right thing to do to take on clients? Like, who's worse to you? The person who is um, doesn't have the best intentions and is kind of shady, um, or the person who helps someone like that become more influential. And I think that we have to look at that and have a responsibility um, to, you know, to curate and the right clients and to make sure we're working with the right people. Um, but I think that you, you nailed it is that, like, uh, with the book, one of my reviews, if you go on Amazon and look at one of my reviews, one of my uh, friends and people and mentors in a way, like I'm, I have a lot of friends that are mentors, is Brand Bukowski. And he started uh, Veterans United. He's a, one of the, the greatest human beings I've ever met in my life. He cares about everyone around him, and he has a, a very kind uh, heart. 
And when he read the book, he goes, I love it. He goes, I thought this was great. However, he's like, I really wanted you to emphasize more on it. You have to come from the right place. He said, the reason why you're successful at a lot of these tactics is that I know you come from the right place. And he said, if there was something that I wanted you to do more in the book is really focus on how you need to have the right mindset when you're trying to do these things. Because if you use it as a tactic to once again, you know, trick people, it can, it can hurt that. And so I think that um, once again, is that you can even look on, yeah, look on his review on Amazon is that, uh, and it's somebody who is a mentor to me and he put that and that's what I love about him is that he was very transparent about it, is that I love the book other than this. And I think that's great. But um, yeah, I think that ultimately you brought up a really good point is that as a company, uh, it starts with leadership. You have to, like, if you come at it and say, hey, we're trying to do this for the right reasons and we're wanting to truly, like, be a leader in this space. I, I talked to you at, um, about meeting Anita at InfusionCon. Now, I've met Clayt before um, several times, and he's their CEO, and uh, and I and I honestly like him like a lot more than a lot of CEOs I meet because, like, he screams how much he wants to help small business out. And, and I like that. I mean, I think that I've been in private conversations and then that hasn't changed. He hasn't said, oh, let's try and like get them to do this so we can get more sales. He's like, I mean, he screams it. And so um, I think that from a leadership side, if you set a really good example from the right reason in the long term, you're going to win. Don't, don't ever go against that to gain influence in the short term and trick people into something when you can naturally engage them in the long term. And it's going to be the overall you know, long term health of the company and your own brand. I think that's such a great answer. It's just a huge, huge topic. And you know, I have to say that there are subtle differences. <laughs> I'm starting to feel like I'm becoming an influencer connoisseur, right? I had a friend who was in the television business and she said that there were people that they called red lighters. And red lighters are people who are one way in front of the camera and a completely different way from away from the camera. And so I thought that was really interesting, and I and I think in the world of social media, uh, you want what really resonates with folks is when um, who you are on social, who you are on video, who who you occur to be, whether they talk to you or not talk to you, speaks volumes, right? So I see you smiling. Why are you smiling about? I'm just that? cracking up at some of the t like some of the the people talking in here. Like uh, one of the things that uh, Tim pointed out is like uh, with influence, there's a lot of people that have never done anything oh, yes. that um, that I mean, that's one of my biggest pet peeves is that uh, and we, we did. We actually I'll be very honest. We started we worked with those people initially. And, and when I mean the, those people, I mean, people who start shouting from the rooftop that they know they, that they know so much and they're trying to share it with others when in reality they've never experienced it at all. And that's where, like, for me, like, um, there's several gurus out there and there's people that are out there selling. They're, they always have made their money selling information that they have no experience with. And so what I would d d just honestly tell people is that when it comes to this area, like, don't just go with what everybody else says. Like, truly look into the people that you listen to. There was one um, influencer that talked about, took pictures of helicopters and Lamborghinis and him with uh, w what he would talk to about women with him. It was just, it drove me nuts because I think that's such a terrible example um, for, you know, how you're consuming content. Because I know there's an 18-year-old or 19-year-old that saw that, that's like, you know what, that's success to me is I go and take pictures of my Lamborghini and I write a guest post on how you get a Lamborghini, you know, how you make money selling info products. And so that's something that like I'm honestly going against right now is that, you know, really be, uh, have a trust, really be careful on who you trust with who's getting you information. And so that's why I would say is that um, just be cautious because there is a negative connotation from some of those people out there. Um, and in reality is that for me, uh, I trust people that tend to care about their audience and you can tell that and are less showy about how awesome they are. Yeah. And you know, and I think that it, it, it boy, this is just the perfect, perfect question. Cause I think we're, that's sort of where the next, the next question that's going to come up for everyone is, are there different types of influence? And let's talk about that. So that mm -hmm. said, you know, there was a formula out there. Right, there was this formula that all the webinars used to do that, you know, and especially the folks who were the tier one, tier two gurus are out there and like, you know, spend an hour talking about, oh, I'm not gonna brag, but 
you know, here's a snapshot of my bank account. You know, that whole, that's a formulaic type of a thing. But there's yeah. influence than that. There's more to influence than a formula. What are some of the different kinds of ways of being influential, whether it's through your content or, you know, to the topic at hand here? Yeah, I mean, so for me, I think that there's, uh, like, if you look at the book, like, the way I look at influence, and once again, I'm, I'm a very big factor on, like, a big person on trust. And so I think that the, f the first kind of state trust is surrounding yourself with credibility or surrounding yourself as a credible company and leader. And so there's different things that you can do or you, you can do as a company to do that. Um, it's It first starts off with actually, once again, like building a company that is is a strong company that offers a good product or service. Um, long and, and a lot of times I talk about long-term um, success for a company and anybody can, uh, there's a lot of people that aren't that smart that make short-term profits. Um, however, for me, like I'm really big on working and helping people that are in it the, for the long term. And so I think that the first step is like, how do you make yourself more credible as a company and as a person? And the first step to that is, is creating a documented content strategy surrounding your company with this is the the type of content we're getting out there that's valuable so we're going to we're going to basically do anything we can in this next four months or three months to get content triggers and when i mean content triggers i mean um it, information that when you're talking to this audience that's valuable to you ask them you know what is valuable for you to know what is i was talking to a flooring company that services small businesses and they only wanted to get content about flooring and I said, no, like that's actually like you guys have like you guys actually have a lot of information about like, for example, they have this partner that is really good at payments. And I told them, I said, well, why don't you loop in this partner to do some guest posting or some webinars about payments? Because you're, um, you know, small business owners need to learn about this stuff as well. And granted, yes, a lot of your content should revolve around, you know, flooring because that is your expertise. It doesn't mean you, you don't look at what information can I get them because the more you become that trusted resource for them, the more they're going to come to you and your company. And so I think at first it's, it's getting a base and a document strategy about like how we're surrounding our company with content that's valuable to this audience. And then you're looking at how do you amplify that when you know what works and what helps the most. And then as you amplify it, some ways are paid, for example, is that, you know, a brand can come to you and say, uh, whether it's like a Google or Sprint, say, hey, you guys have a really engaging audience, which I can tell. I have people, you know, commenting on Twitter, your audience is engaged. And so that is valuable. And those are tactics that you look at once you kind of get that core content and you know what does well. And that's where it's like, I think that the first level of influence is that how do we surround ourselves with consistent content that engages people that earns their trust and then how do we amplify that content by using methods both earned and paid um, you know which basically that's the one that is a catalyst so at first when you start kind of surrounding yourself with content and you can do things to for example uh, form relationships with other influencers and contributors as you get the content out there um, you know send something to me like for if there's something in my area that's valuable um, to share with my audience, I'll, you know, I'll cover it. I mean, it just depends if I have time or what's in the pipeline, but, um, you know, getting, that's like a PR opportunity that you, that I can source your, your content that builds credibility for you. And so there's a variety of things. Like I said, the first stage is surrounding yourself with the content that's most valuable. And then the next stage is kind of amplification. And as you learn what works, you amplify it more, more through earned and paid channels. And then ultimately, um, that influence turns into kind of a status where you can, actually influence people's behaviors um, after you know gaining their trust and getting the co getting different content um, in front of them and then it's also not just about content um, I'm biased because I run a content marketing agency and company and so like don't limit it to that it's about how your employees interact with people on an everyday basis how you interact with people everybody matters in a way where the other day I was on LinkedIn and somebody shared out about the book I actually I, like I wish I could pull it up right now because I, I love seeing it as that um, a guy commented and said, is this book wor really worth reading? Um, you know, it was basically about content marketing, but I'm like really trying to work on my relationship management here. And I responded on LinkedIn and I said, hey, so I would read chapters one through six. I focus a lot or one through five. I focus a lot more on the, uh, the relationships and that um, six through eight or nine are, are more about content. So, you know, if you want to skip that, you can. And he wrote back, he goes, oh, crap. 
I can't believe the author responded to this. This is crazy. And so like, I think that, um, you know, it's not just about content, it's about how you communicate and engage. Um, and, and like, for example, in the book, I give people an email, um, top of mind help, uh, at gmail.com or, uh, and, uh, I responded to that when somebody emailed me the other day within like 10 minutes and she goes, is this really John? And I go, <laughs> yeah, it's John. And, and, and I said, and so you do those things because, um, once again, it's about trust. And you can't just say, I'm going to create content that's a trusted resource for people, and then I'm not going to really embrace it through how we communicate with our uh, you know, customers, our partners, our employees. You have to across the, the, across the whole company. And so that's why I think it's important. It's not just about content. That's why when you read the book, the first five chapters are not about content. It's about, it's about how you set that up and embrace uh, authenticity, how you embrace engagement, how you embrace how you truly help an audience out. And then after you get that mindset, then we can talk about content. Okay, so this is not on the script, but I have to ask it because of what you said. Because one of the things that, I, you know, that some of the best influencers that I like to engage with, because like I said, I'm an influencer connoisseur, because there's certain influencers I just love to learn from and talk to. And one of those characteristics is they always find the time to respond. And not just to another influencer or not just to a brand, but to anyone who asks them a question. And you just talked at length about that. Um, do you think that, and so I always have to ask myself, how does somebody that used to be responsive not, is not so responsive anymore? Is it possible to become too busy, too influential, uh, to have that kind of response? Yeah, so I'll tell you honestly, like mine, because um, it always drove me nuts when someone like there's a probably one of the most influential people in our space. Um, uh, as they got more influential, uh, I've been at events with them where somebody's asked them, "Hey, like, hey, can you help out there?" And they just shrug them over. It's almost like they're too cool for school. And right. I, I told my uh, wife and I told my co-founder, "If you ever see me do things like that, as I, I become more influential, I want you to hit me in the face." And uh, that's <laughs> I mean, like, uh, I didn't really mean it. And I, but my wife probably would would beat me up if she saw me doing that stuff. Um, but it, at the same time, it's like, yes, there there's a f there's a factor that comes in where you become more busy. Uh, or, or busier and um, for me it, the challenge with like I want to respond um, pre pretty consistently and, and frequently to people but it's it's honestly it's tough to distinguish who's like trying to sell me these days and who's not so like I, I just got like four or five emails today this morning and I looked at them and I was gonna respond but then I looked at it and I was like oh these people clearly have another agenda and they're not trying to truly like ask for help they're basically saw me on a podcast or something like this and they were like oh if i just ask him for help and then i looked and i was like wait a minute i've seen like they just messaged my team saying we want to sell you and so for me the battle is is like i have to like i want to uh, respond to people and it doesn't anybody who says they become too busy and they've got like i hate the emails and i have a lot of friends that do this they say oh i get a thousand emails a day uh and i'm like bombarded i don't know how to i can ever respond to this i'm like Dude, I, I like. I want to give you some email management. Like, I want to like let's let's talk this out because like I have a zero inbox every night because like I pretty much go through. I mean, not every night if I'm traveling. Obviously, it's different. But um, for me, it's like you know sometimes it just takes a quick sentence to say, hey, you should check out this resource or you should check out this tool or you should check this out. And I think that we're not going to be perfect. We're going to miss things. Um, you know, as you do get busier. But at the same time is that I think that you still should always have the intention on, you know, how do I help the, the, the people that are paying attention, that do trust me? And so I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm certainly not. I miss things all the time. Um, but at the same time is that I do try and make a conscious effort to always remember that um, there's a reason why people listen to me or follow me. And that's because of trust. And I need to remember is that it's these people that help. Like they distribute my content. They're the ones that say, hey, do you, like uh, I just got booked in for a speaking gig and it was because someone who follows my content said, hey, you've got to listen to this person. Now, if I don't respect that person when they reach out for a you know, quick, hey, can you tweet this out or can you share this out? This is really important. My book just got released. I always try to, um, you know, to, to come and, and help them out, um, but it's hard. So I would say the short answer to that is, um, yes, as people get busy, it's harder, but it doesn't mean you, you don't, try and make an effort and you should have the intention and never have the idea that oh well that's just the little person or that's the, 
the person that I don't have enough time for, um, you should still try and make a, an effort to be there for them when you need them. And if you if you can't help someone else out, um, and sooner or later it, it it always comes around, there'll be somebody there to to be a resource for them that can truly help them. So let's get into the details of helping some other folks out because the last few questions are really all about content, how to use content, uh, how to become more influential through content. So let's just kind of start there. If you are, first of all, first of all, how do you identify, how does one identify, let's say you're a small business owner, right? And, and we all know that going from what we would call vendor to expert mm -hmm. is a good move, clearly. Right, it's a profitable move to be seen as an expert, to be sought out as the. And, and I say this, John. For example, I have the folks that work on um, their local business here in my town, and they do remodeling. And when I need expert advice, guess what I do? I call them. Mm -hmm. Right, because I trust them. They've educated me. All the things that you've talked about just goes to show that you can be an influencer in any space. Right. Now, these folks don't do blog posts or anything. The way they share their content is face-to-face -face or over the phone. I call them, I ask them a question, they answer it, and they educate me. Now, my question for you is, how else can small business owners use content or identify that area where they are influential? Is that something that other people show you, or can you choose your space of influence? Like, how do you go about that? Uh, I think there's a couple things. One, um, don't pick an area that you don't truly have a passion for. Uh, I can promise you this. It's very hard to write and talk about something that you don't care that much about. I've tried, trust me, and it sucks. <laughs> Um, and so like for me, you know, like I, I try, like I want to pick an area, like one of the reasons why I like talking about this area is because I was an unknown person five years ago that had no brand, that had no, um, I mean like, shoot, I mean my grandma really didn't even know what I did. Um, and so like it's, it's a situation where this sort of mindset has really helped me out, not just professionally, it obviously has with the company, but personally. Like I actually am a happier person now than I was five years ago because of kind of the mindset and the stuff I wrote about in the book. You can tell that. Um, I was fairly egotistical. I was fairly um, me-centered. Um, and I think that as I've truly kind of, I don't know, I guess learned it, like not to say like midlife crisis or like get all emotional, um, but it's, it, it, we got to be proud of what we do. And we ha and you want to be passionate about um, what you do. And so for me, I think that you know I can I, I find I found this area um, kind of about the, you know with thought leadership and, and engagement and, and things around that. But um, yeah, I would say first is that first you be have a, have interest. Actually, be curious because if you're truly going to be intelligent in the space, you have to have a natural curiosity about it because you're gonna be a better expert if you know your stuff. You call the person, like I call my plumber because my plumber has an amazing answer and an honest answer every time I call him. I don't call any other plumber in the city, um, call him. And it's because he consistently loves it. He loves everything about plumbing, which is really cool um, for him. And I support him. Like he's a small business owner that I love and respect. And um, I think that uh, he, that's really important. Um, and so, you know, don't, really try there's enough like there like it's as crazy as it is, people make decisions based on money and like I know a, like there was a, somebody who was just telling me the other day that this person became an expert in the yarn industry and I was like you're kidding me I, I hadn't heard of this person but they said yeah and they make a couple million dollars a year and they're an expert in this yarn field and I'm like in yarn and I'm like that's amazing like I think that's well, great and I so tell you. I, think, I have to interrupt you because I can tell you that one of my friends Amy Novakuski is on the chat right now, and she is a yarn fool. <laughs> That's awesome. It's probably her, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's not her. However, okay. I'm sure that she might want to know who this person is. <laughs> I'm sure she does. I, it was just something we were joking around about this exact topic is that um, I was talking to, as crazy as this guy was a CMO of one of the largest companies out there, um, or in the United States at least, and he was talking about like, where do I find where, like, where's my, and I think he's not having a midlife crisis. He's just trying to say, hey, I've, I, like, where, where do I go to truly offer value? Like, how can I differentiate myself? And I said, well, don't just say like one of the mistakes that I made at first is I was like, well, I'm a content marketing PR thought leadership 
jack of all trades expert, which is it's kind of BS. And I've tried to get away from that now and, and focus on specific things I, I'm really passionate in and can truly help and learn about consistently. And so, um, you know, don't try and be the jack of all trades. Try and say, what is an area that I can really own and differentiate myself? Um, and, you know, be that true expert. Don't say guru or ninja. Like I've seen the, t the Twitter, Twitter feed is cracking me up with the word ninja. I actually, I don't think I've said the word ninja in the last year until I've been on this Twitter feed. And that's something like, I, I appreciate you guys talking and, and raising these points is that, you know, like uh, there's a lot of people that are really, really promotional in their Twitter profile, for example. And I, I looked at mine during this and I said, you know, for me, I, I try and look at it and say, okay, I want to like in this case, I say co-founder of Influence and co-author of Top of Mind.com, expert or speaker, John Hall speaking, and then Forbes Inc. columnist, and then I put most importantly, father, husband, and that's like uh, for me the reason why I, I want to direct people to that is because that's what people most ask. They ask about is where's your content. Um, where can I look at for more information? Um, I could have put number one speaker here. I could have put different things um, that I've gotten accolades, but I chose not to. I chose to say, here are the resources where they can learn more. And then um, honestly, the most important thing to me is that I'm a father and a husband. It, it, anybody who knows me knows that like that's my most important thing uh, in life. And so for me, um, you know, I think that humanizes you. And that's why, like, when I looked at um, the profile before, I said, um, you know, I, I saw the, the five uh, kids there, and I was like, that's amazing. Like, I love when I see true personality, and it makes me feel more connected to people. So I, I would advise people is that when you get a chance to, um, you know, present yourself, present yourself in a way that it humanizes yourself and doesn't present that you are insecure and you want everybody to know how cool you are, I would say that, um, you know, they'll, the more they can feel connected to you, the more that there'll be a real relationship. That's just a wonderful answer. And I think, what would you say to people who, um, I think people really struggle with that. You know, I think the whole Twitter profile and how do you, you know, how you choose to think about that and how you choose to describe yourself, whether that's on your LinkedIn profile, your Twitter profile, anywhere where you have this a finite amount of space where you have to communicate so much in such a yeah. tiny, tiny space, you know. So um, let's talk about, as we wind the chat down, oh, you know what? I had some general questions about the book. I'm not even going to go the, to the topic here because I wanted to make sure I had some general questions. Yeah, let, well, that was it. Let's talk about digital content. You know, let's talk about uh, some specifics here about uh, what are some of the, you know, we, I think we've been d done a good job of trashing influencers in general, right? Well, I hope we weren't that bad. <laughs> the wrong kind of influencers. Or There's a lot like, of really good ones out there. Badly. <laughs> I, I love what Ken Gordon was talking about ego, right? The battle between big ego and small ego. And so that kind of wrapped itself around that topic. But influence, being an influencer does have a benefit, right? People seek you out uh, for conversations that you are passionate about. What are some other benefits that a small business owner can get to become an influencer? Because becoming an influencer is a lot of work, right? I mean, it requires content. It requires reaching out. It, whether you're speaking, you're writing, or uh, whatever, on video, um, small business owners want the benefits of being an influencer, but it takes a lot of work. So what are some of those benefits that are worth the work? Yeah, I mean, you, you create, and I think that being efficient with time is important and doing your best. Like, there's a couple comments here that it was like, hey, like, I can't, I'm not, um, you know, I can't respond, to, uh, or it's hard for me to uh, respond to every email, or especially unsolicited e emails. But I, like, what I would say is that for me, I look at doing everything to do with building my influence in the most efficient and effective way. And so for me, like with responding to those emails, a lot of times those are emails that I will take, you know, five or 10 seconds to respond. I mean, if I have to think through it, then yes, it, it creates a, a challenge a lot more. But a lot of times people are just asking for, you know, quick things that, and that's where like, I wanna encourage, uh, be effective with your time. I, I'm not saying that 40 hours of your week should be building your influence. Absolutely not. I, I, I think that run, as a small business owner, like I was a small business owner when I was once in, well, in third grade selling my lunch, but 
my first real business was real estate and uh, I was hustling. I went to 34 banks before I could get my first loan. <laughs> and so when you look at that, it's very hard to tell them for me to tell you, okay, well, you know, it took me 34 banks to get a loan. Um, but during that time, I want you to be creating content and to do, do all this uh, stuff. And, and so for me, it's like, I, I think that you look at it from a standpoint and say, okay, well, first let's take this a, a step by step. It's not going to happen overnight. I don't care if it's just allocating 30 minutes or an hour of your time a week towards this. You'll take steps towards it. And as long as you have it documented, you, you are consistently learning, you're, you're, you're listening to people that you truly feel like are helping guiding you through that step-by-step -step process, um, just you know keep doing that and you'll get there. And the, the benefits are amazing from a standpoint of the, of the inbound opportunities is that um, nowadays, like I will tell you, like I grew up as a, a and, I, and a hustler is a bad, I, I hate that a lot of entrepreneurs say the word hustle in such a bad way. <laughs> when I say hustle, I just mean, yeah, I mean like work hard and do your best to obtain, like, don't give up easy. Like, and, and so for me is that that was those 34 banks I was telling you about. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it really, as I've become more influential, it, I'm not saying I hustle a lot less. I still try to work hard and create opportunities. But I'll tell you, is there's, there's a lot of opportunities that come to you. Is that, for example, I was talking to an, or, uh, an orthodontist who's my neighbor. And we were talking about referral partners. And he was saying that, you know, like, I mean, he's a successful, great orthodontist in our town. Everybody really seems to like him a lot. But I was looking at him from a referral partner side. And I was saying, honestly, like, you, you have the opportunity to expand so much more with these refer, with these, refer, with these partners um, because like, you're not consistently engaging them. Ultimately, you might pay attention to them once a year. But you're not consistently staying top of mind. Book plug there. But I was like, I, like I wrote the book top of mind, and I didn't realize how often I said top of mind even before the book, because it's so important. Is that if someone trusts you and you come to mind at the right time, they will send an opportunity your way. And so for that orthodontist, what's the difference between the benefit, the payoff for him uh, making the investment? Well, if he can do that instead of him having to go to the community, they're not the, let, let's say those events, those networking events that everybody hates to go to because you're just trying to like, I don't know, you're trying to just network the hell out of it and not actually like enjoy yourself. You're not doing that as much and he's getting referral leads that are natural to him where he can sit in his office and actually enjoy spending time with his patients and his staff um, rather than having to go do that as much. And so the payoff for me that I'll honestly tell you is that, and I don't want to make it like I don't do work. I'm still working a lot, but I will tell you that more opportunity comes to me than ever did before where companies are like, let's partner together. Oh, hey, can I include you in this? Or can I involve you in this? Or, hey, I have this person who'd be a great client for you. And so that's where um, the payoff for me has been tremendous, where um, I think that there's just more opportunity. And I, I would say that I've created my own luck a little more. And people think luck is like something that's just spontaneous and lucky where whatever definition you look at it, I look at luck a little different. I, if you prepare and you create these natural opportunities from, uh, you know, building trust with certain audiences, then when it comes down to it is that luck will happen a lot more and that serendipitous uh, opportunity will come to you. Wow. That's great advice, right? There is, it's not, you're not going to stop working hard. You're not, you're just going to keep doing it, keep doing what you're doing, keep being who you're being. And that's actually, uh, when you look at the stream, if I look distracted, it's what it is because I'm looking at the stream and there's, there's quite a healthy discussion here on whether being an influencer is part of your branding exercise or, you know, what role does your own personality playing at, you know, that there's a whole conversation going on around that. Um, yeah. Oh my goodness. What haven't I asked you? What haven't we <laughs> talked about that's in the book that we really should be talking about, right? What do you think are some uh, of the big lessons and um, things that a small business owner will get out of this book? Because I really love the title. That's what attracted me the most. Uh, unleash your influence and engage those who matter. And I think what I liked about that title is because uh, as we were putting the chat together, the big piece of conversation was, I don't think that people know what it is about themselves that makes them influential. So it's, you know, how do you discover this thing that makes you influential so that you can unleash it? 
well, yeah, and also it's like what I think in the book, um, like a lot of t times people um, write books just for professional reasons. Like there's obviously a benefit and a bias of why this book would be beneficial to my company given what we do. It's uh, it's obvious there, but I, I think that as people read the book, um, that's why I think people, it was kind of a pleasant surprise. They expected it to be like a advertisement on why like you should hire your company because that's where or my company and that's why a lot of books are um you know that's why it's hard to trust a lot of books but i mean for for me like something that you met you you missed there which it, which uh, a lot of people do is it said um it's top of mind it's, it's basically how to unleash your influence and engage those who matter to you and so the to you part is very very important a lot of people say that you know to people that matter uh the reason why i added to you is because um, people who matter, there's like an there's like an obsession with okay, well, somebody who's who's has more influence matters more. Wow. Where in reality is that to me, that's not the case. I think that to, to with the people that matter to you is very very different. And so, for example, my mother matters to me a significant amount. My sister matters to me. Are they influential? No, my sister and mother. I mean, like, grant, granted, they have some influence with me and, and, and certain other people. And, and once again, I tell you, everybody has some level of influence, but I, but they matter to me. Um, my best friends, my relationships matter to me. My, um, you know, work contacts, um, you know, matter me, to me. So it's like, you know, you can have this mindset of how do I gain influence from a professional that's going to benefit my company, that's going to make me more money. Uh, for me, I think that the what I try and incorporate in the book is that let's let's have this mindset. It's like I, I studied studied habits, and you can't have habits and a mindset in one side of your life and not your personal life. So if you try and say, I mean, you can try to, but it's not gonna you're not gonna be as effective. So what I, in the book that I hope you guys get or whoever you know reads it and and kind of pulls from it is that it's not just about professional gain; it's about personal gain as well. And create these habits, like so. For example, one of the I talk about gift giving. Um, don't just like like for example, listen to, like uh, listen to like the example that I give in the book is a, a managing editor. It was their wet or it was their wedding and. Uh, I, or it was, and they had a registry. Well, I went on and bought all the small things on it, and said, "Hey, it's the small things that matter uh, in life." I didn't spend thousands of dollars. I spent like less than a hundred, so it wasn't buying them off or anything. But uh, the small things were uh, something that I liked that somebody bought off my registry, so I, I, I did that. Now that obviously had a professional gain because um, that was something where it was just a thoughtful thing to do for the managing, or I was trying to be thoughtful to the, the managing editor. Um, and I actually, to be honest, like I love, I love her. She's an awesome person. She cares about content more than most people, and so I, I, I truly wanted to just do something nice for her. Um, but at the same time, is that you know, I, I try and do that in my personal life too now. Um, before I never got gifts and and things for people, um, like to, because I almost was like, oh, is this bribing? But then I looked at it as like, if you truly listen to people, and like as simple as this is, I was playing a, a outdoor game um, last summer with one of uh, my neighbors, and she was having a beer, and she goes, "Man, if I only had a cup holder while I was playing this board, this uh, this we were playing washers, and it, while we were playing washers, and I go, yeah, like." A absolutely. I go, if you had that, that'd be awesome. I went on during that game on Amazon and I bought those stakeholders that you put in the ground and, and, and I sent them to her and they were like to $8 or $10. She still to this day brings that up where we're like, we were playing washers and like John bought this and I didn't used to do that ever. I would just have a, keep drinking and play washers. I was having fun. But I think that um, if there's something I want to pull at you to pull from the book is like looking at some of these things that I talk about and saying, how can I apply these in my professional and personal life? And I hope that it helps you build relationships, um, you know, with, in my case, it was my neighbor or someone close to me, because I think the more you see those things happen, the more you embrace them in both of those lives and you'll become, um, you'll get more inbound opportunities in addition to, you'll be happier. Like I, I, I'm kind of addicted to it now, which is kind of funny is that like, I truly love doing those sort of things for people. And it's even like some I do anonymous, like I'm telling you these just because it's a good example, but I like to do anonymous things all the time that people don't even necessarily sometimes know it's me. Now, granted, that's not great for branding or some of the things that we're talking about, but from a standpoint of, uh, it makes me feel better. So uh, I think that's, a, even though, it, you know, it seems kind of hearted, it's selfish in a way because what I'm trying to do is it does make me feel better to do those certain things, but I hope it comes off um, when I do those things to people. I hope it comes off nat like uh, more from an authentic side of things and it doesn't seem like I am coming from a, uh, a way that's not 
authentic or uh, not genuine. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up with one big question that I usually ask in the beginning, but I'm going to ask it at the end. So, John Hall, what do you know for sure based on everything we've talked about today? What do I know for sure? I don't know anything for sure. I mean, like, <laughs> it's uh, for for me, like, uh, when it comes to being certain, it only puts a weakness in you that you're not open to other information or other point of views. And so, like, I know that might be a bad answer to it, but, like, to be honest with you, like, I, I think that nat natural curiosity, and even if I feel I really, really know something or said something, it doesn't mean that um, I ever know something for 100% certain. Um, it's more is that uh, I, try and get as much information I, as I can to make the best decisions and then always be open to other points of view or other information because um, one slight thing can change how you, uh, you generate a piece of content distributed or or just how you interact with someone and so um, I know that's probably a bad answer but in reality it's it, I, 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 hear, <laughs> I, I hear an answer inside of your answer right what you know for sure is you should be open and curious I mean, yeah, you should always you should always be a consistent learner, and you should always uh, be deliberate about how you're getting information. And and just because you feel like you know something doesn't mean you don't ask this uh, a, the same question to somebody different. Or um, there's been so many times where I felt like I knew that this was a tactic that was the best, and then I uh, ask a friend like, "Have you ever done something like this?" Even though I already asked three people it, and they're like, "Oh, you have to check this out. Like I used this tool and I did this," and I'm like, "Oh crap, that's so much of a better way." And so I would definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, never be too cocky. Um, there's a lot of situations in that history has shown us where, it, I mean, whether it's Greek or Roman times or, or our own history or our recent U.S. history or whatever, if you act like you know everything and you're not open to what possibly could happen or getting better and always be open to getting better, um, you put yourself at a big weakness. And uh, a lot of times you can lose uh, uh, whatever you're trying to accomplish. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. Cool. Well, yeah, something that I'll, I'll, you say, that was your last question, but something I'll tell you is uh, just look at the people who've engaged um, on the Twitter chat. And um, if you have a personal connection to them, uh, send it to uh, whoever you think was the most engaged person. You can call out and say thank you. And um, if you can, reach out to them, get their address, and I'll send them a personalized copy of the book and thank them for engaging on this. And so, um, yeah, if you could do that for me, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Just pick somebody out to, so that I could send a, a personalized copy of the book to. Awesome. We will do that. They're absolutely going to love it. How generous of you, John. Thank you so much. There you have it, everyone. Another plugged in edition of Visit Palooza Chat on Monday. Join us next week where we've got Susan Solovic from Fox Business, who's going to talk about the 1% Edge. And got definitely want to thank our guest today, John Hall, who talked about influence. Join us again every Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific for Bizapalooza Chat. John, thank you so much for being here. All right. Thanks for having me.